this the Bible church. Why don't you stand with us so we can sing with one heart and one voice how Jesus Christ has transformed us, given us new life. Come on, let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. There we go. Good morning. So glad y'all are here. Um, if this is your first time visiting, if you're new here or if you feel new here, I want to encourage you in the back of your seat in front of you, there's a welcome card. If you'd fill that out, that allows us to get to know a little bit about you. It's also got a place where you can write any prayer requests that you may have. And so we'd love to pray for you tomorrow when we come together as a staff 
And also, if there's something good going on, we love when we get a card on a Monday morning and it's got a rejoicing thing on it. So if you've got that, put it on there as well. We'd love to know about that. One of the greatest moments in a church, one of my favorite things is when we baptize. And so we've got some baptisms this morning. And so I'm going to throw it to Pastor Bob. Thank you, Ty. We baptize on the second Sunday of every month. And so if maybe you're here and you're going to watch what we're going to do in just a moment, you're thinking, I think I would like to be baptized. Please talk to me after the service. We'd love to celebrate this with you. As a church, we believe baptism is a very important step along the journey of a, of a person's spiritual walk. It's not the starting line. The starting line for faith is when you accept Jesus as your Savior. That's the moment of conversion. At that moment, at that twinkle of an eye, when you put your faith in Christ, you are saved, and you're never going to be more saved than at that moment. But what baptism is, it's kind of like that mile marker. It's when you're going to want to declare to those around you that you love Jesus, and that you want everybody to know that you love Jesus. And so it's a beautiful thing as we get to celebrate this with these two individuals today. And so we're going to show a video of Carl Peterson. And as Carl gets ready to come in to be baptized, I want you to draw your attention to the screen. My name's Carl Peterson, and uh, I've been at Odessa Bible Church for, I don't know, five years now. And uh, it's home. It's, it's home. I've been in Odessa pretty much all of my life. I've got uh, an eight-year-old son at home. You know, my, uh, my faith in Christ is, has been a very strong thing my entire life. Um, I grew up in the Mormon church, and when I began to research and find things that I didn't understand, things that didn't add up, you know, then I began looking for a modern Christian church, something that um, I would fit into and something that, you know, my entire view of Christ and God and the Trinity and the scriptures has changed with my trip to Odessa Bible Church. And so I, I guess I've always had a strong faith in Christ, but um, coming to Odessa Bible Church has steered that in a completely different direction. Amen, Carl. I'm so glad to be able to share this with you. You and I have had lots of good discussions. It's been a joy to get to know you and your family. We'll see B. Marie right there, but we're so delighted that you are part of our church. Are you trusting in Jesus as your Savior today? I am. Amen, I am. amen. Well, it's my pleasure to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized with Christ in baptism, and then raised to walk in a newness of life. Step right off this. Now, I want to draw your attention to the screen once again as James Newby prepares to be baptized. James. My name is James Newby. You know, you know, Kezia, Riker, and Brianna is my family. I've been coming to Odessa Bible Church for on 12 years now. You know, it used to be you know, the, the, the dad that was only here on holidays or you know, special events. You know, as I was younger, I was always kind of forced upon to go to church. And then as a teenager, you know, just rebellious, fell into you know, rough times and you know, with drug addiction and just living, living that, that crazy lifestyle and, you know, led me to get into you know, a bunch of trouble. And then until I got with my wife, you know, I was headed right back down that road. She helped me want to be a better person. And she, she got me coming to her church that she's been a part of since she was an infant. I never felt like I belonged in a church just because the way that I, I lived. And so that's why I was that here and there, you know, uh, church goer. I'm not sure how many years ago, whenever Riker got baptized, whenever I really started started thinking about it for myself. So, you know, this is my next step, and you know, taking that leap, and you know, share with the world that you know, you know, God is my Savior, and you know, I've had accepted Him, you know, into my heart. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, James, are you trusted in Christ as your Savior today? Yes, sir. Amen. Well, it's my pleasure to baptize you, my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, 
and then raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Come on this way. Like I said, and many of you might have been in that place in your spiritual life where you're just kind of teetering, wondering if maybe what do I need to do next? How do I need to, where's that next step in my spiritual journey? I want to say, if you haven't been baptized, that's it. You, you testify through a large group of people and say, I love Jesus and I want everybody to know about it. I love Christ. He's changed my life and my journey has taken me all kinds of different ways. But I want people to know that I am moving forward in my journey with Christ. And so we're proud of these two men who are saying this. What a testimony to them, to Christ. Christ, to their family, to our community of faith. And so let me pray as we prepare to sing. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have today to celebrate this with these families. Father, these men who are taking the lead in their homes and Lord, how you've brought them to this place. And so we're just so thankful for the opportunity to be a part of that journey. And Father, to help them, help us see a fuller picture of who you are and your grace and your truth and your love for us. So as we open your word today, as we think about how your sovereign hand leads us into that place of hope and that place of rest, Lord, I pray that these stories would come to mind, that you can do the same thing for us. It's in Christ Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. Abel.
I'm so grateful for you, Jesus. For your name, for your blood, for the cross. We just want to come to you with a clean heart.
Father God, we thank you for being in this place with us this morning. We thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for every day that you walk with us. And God, I pray that as we come together this morning and we know you're here with us, that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes, Father. Speak to us. Let us leave here stronger and encouraged. We praise the name of Jesus Christ and ask everything in that name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated, and kids, y'all can go to Children's Church. Before we get going, I want to say thank you if you're in here today, and you were there yesterday as we did the second layer of work that we did on the house on Jackson Street. Um, it was a really good time, and it went quicker than I thought it would. And it proved to me that God can use anybody as long as you're willing. Because if you know anything about me, putting siding on the front of anything is not in my skill set. Um, yet, I was able to find use and a purpose, and I filled in all of the screw holes with putty, or not all of them, uh, some of them. <laughs> but it was an exciting time. We're going to continue projects like that. And so I want to encourage you, keep your eyes out and come and be a part of that. Life can be an amazing journey sometimes, but life can also be a crazy journey sometimes. Life can be so full of these moments that are just so good. Life can be so full of, of joy and promise, and other times life can be really, really hard. It can be this thing that is full of a lot of heartache, a lot of burden, and a lot of pain. Sometimes life is a great journey, and sometimes life is a very hard journey. And it's no different for us in our Christian life. Sometimes our walk with Christ can be this amazing, joyous thing, and sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes it can be difficult. And at times when life is really, really tough, at times when life is really, really hard, it leads us in those moments to ask a lot of questions, right? We ask ourselves questions like, why? Why me? Why now? Why again? Why this time? Why did they do what they did? Or why will they not do what they said they would do? We ask ourselves questions like, what did I do? What do I do now? How do I get through this? How am I supposed to move forward? How am I supposed to find light in this moment? And we ask ourselves questions like, where is God? And what is God doing what is God doing in me and what is God doing through this situation that I find myself in? It's a, a deal that we, we go through this a lot, I do, in the world of recovery, right? I've asked myself these questions in 16 years of sobriety and I work through these questions with individuals in counseling and in recovery ministry quite a bit. In fact, one of the big pieces of healing in the world of recovery is exploring the roles that you and people in your life had in your situation, in your addiction, in your trauma, the role that others played, your abuse, the people that mistreated you, the people that abandoned you, the people that 
took advantage of you. We have to explore our role in the situation, what we did to make the matter worse, what we did to push that down the road into an area that becomes problematic. And a lot of times in faith-based recovery, I help people walk through the questions of God. What was God's role in this? Why did God allow this to happen? What was God doing through that situation? And it's not a question and it's not a theme that presents itself only in the world of recovery. It's a theme that is common in our world. We are constantly asking ourselves questions about what other people have done, what we have done, what we should do, and what is God doing? Why would they do that? What do I do now? And where is God? And what is God doing? It's certainly a theme that is present as we go through Joseph's story. I mean, look at the point that we're at in Joseph's story up to today where Pastor Bob led us, right? Joseph comes from this family that has got a whole lot of drama going on, right? I mean, it is keeping up with the Kardashians mixed in with like real world. It's a crazy show. And not only that, but he's got these dreams that God's given him. And these dreams put him in a, in a sticky situation because he's not mature enough to hold his tongue. He's got to share that dream with everybody. And now today, we're going to get into the meat of Joseph's story. And so as we get into the the meat of Joseph's story, I'm going to read kind of a summary of the text. In Genesis 39, the story picks up and it says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. So this is after his brothers, right, had sold him into slavery. After they debated killing him, they've thrown him in a hole, pulled him out of the hole and said, look, there come merchants. Let's simply sell him to the merchants. And so he's been sold into slavery And it says, And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under Joseph's authority. So Joseph is sold into slavery and he finds himself on the slave market in Egypt where he's purchased by this man, Potiphar, and he goes into Potiphar's house. Now this guy is well-to-do. He's high up on the food chain in Egypt. And so he ends up serving in his house and then he ends up getting promoted and ends up kind of running everything. But then he runs in in verse seven to a snag. And in verse seven, it says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. And so he finds himself in this man Potiphar's house, but there's a snag in Potiphar's house. Apparently, Joseph is not only young and a little bit arrogant, but he's strapping and very good looking and good shape. And so he catches the eye of Potiphar's wife. And so she begins to to offer herself to him, and he rejects her time and time again and basically says, look, everything that belongs to your husband, to my master, has been given into my hand. There's nothing that I can't touch or have control over except you, and I'm not going to do this thing because it would be a sin against God. And so she's not okay with that, and so she sets him up for a fall, right? She invites him in one day or finds him and makes her um, temptation to him and he refuses. And so she tears off a piece of his garment and she begins to, to cry out that this young Hebrew boy had done her wrong. And so it picks up in verse 19 and it says, so it was when his master, that's Potiphar, heard the words which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant did this to me after this manner. And his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. 
But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So Potiphar's wife tempts him. He refuses. She sets him up and Potiphar finds out about it when his wife cries out. And so he ends up in prison. But when he's in prison, he again finds himself promoted and he ends up kind of running things in the prison. And then we pick up in chapter 40 and it says, it came to pass after these things, he's in prison that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord and the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. Your version may say cupbearer and baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king who were confined in the prison had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came to them in the morning and he looked and he saw that they were sad. And so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, we each have had a dream and there's no interpreter of it. And so Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me. And so these two personal employees, these are people that are very close to Pharaoh. And they find themselves in prison because they've offended Pharaoh in some way. And they begin to have dreams. And Joseph steps up and says, I can interpret these dreams. And so he does interpret them. And they basically come out to, one of you is going to get released back into working for Pharaoh. And one of you is, is going to die. And the, the, the thing comes to fruition and the story kind of ends in verse 19, and it says, Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. That's the one that's going to pay with his life. Now, it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker from among his servants. Then he restored the butler to his position, but he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but had forgotten him. And so Joseph's in slavery. He's tempted by Potiphar's wife. He ends up in prison when he refuses her. In prison, he begins to take ownership and leadership of the prison. He interprets these dreams. One of the servants dies. One of them's promoted. Yet when he goes before Pharaoh, he forgets Joseph's role in his story, and he doesn't bring it up to Pharaoh. So let's start out talking about the human roles in this story, right? Last week, Bob called it the human agency. It's the role that people play in our lives and the role that these people played in the life of Joseph. And it is the ability of the people around us to affect the things that happened in our lives. I mean, look at Joseph's story. The human agency or the human role plays a very big part in Joseph's story. The, the story as we pick it up today starts after his brothers, right, in, in perhaps one of the most human moves ever, sells him into slavery. That's a pretty human action, is it not? They're offended that he's dad's favorite, and now they're offended that he's having these dreams that they're going to bow to him, and so they decide to kill him. Then they decide, no, we'll throw him in this pit and leave him. Then they decide, no, we'll pull him out and sell him to this slave merchants that are coming across our path. And that's a very human action because it's driven by very human emotions, right? It's driven by pride. It's driven by greed. We don't want this boy to be dad's favorite. He's the youngest next to Benjamin. They, they don't want him to reign over them. And they're jealous and they're envious and they're angry. That's a very human set of emotions. Then we come into the interaction, the encounter that he has with Potiphar's wife. She tempts him time and time and time again. And each time that he's tempted, he does avoid the, the sin against God. He does avoid the temptation, but she continues to tempt him to the point to where driven by very human emotions and flesh things like lust and pride, 
She gets angry that he won't give in to her offerings. And so she sets him up for a huge fall. And because of her role in the story, he finds himself locked up in prison. And then we come across the chief baker and the chief cupbearer who have these dreams. And Joseph steps in and does his job. And he interprets the dreams. And then the cupbearer is released. His life is spared. And Joseph makes one request of this man that serves Pharaoh, when you get back in front of Pharaoh, remember me. In other words, when you get there, would you tell him that I interpreted your dream and that you owe where you're at to this man that's running the prison and maybe I can get released? And does the cupbearer remember Joseph when he goes back in front of Pharaoh? No, forgets all about him. It slips his mind because he too is human. He's a little bit selfish. He's just happy that while the other guy's swinging on a rope, he got to go back to the Pharaoh's house. And he's probably terrified thinking, I can't do whatever I did again because next time I probably won't get released. And so all of these very human roles play a story in Joseph's life. And there's some positive human interaction as well, right? Potiphar, before his wife got involved, found favor with Joseph, or Joseph found favor with him. The prison guards seem to care and take care of Joseph. But it's really in the, the story revolves around really those human roles that had a negative impact on him, and that's human agency, Their role in Joseph's story, in his condition, their ability to affect his future and the outcome of it. But here's what I want us to understand this morning. Here's the point of the human interaction with Joseph in his story. Joseph had zero control over what they did. Joseph had zero say, zero input in what their actions were. Think about it. It was 1 verses 12 with his brothers. And he was the smallest of the 12. Then you look at Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife was not your average farmer's wife. She was a woman of wealth. She was a woman of influence. She had a high position in the household of somebody that ranked very high on the Egyptian food chain. And so now what you've got is her word against his. So who do you think they're going to listen to? The word of a very wealthy Egyptian woman or the word of a Hebrew servant. They had no control in that. And then when it comes to the cupbearer, the cupbearer walked out of the prison that day, but Joseph didn't. So he had no control, no over say over what the cupbearer would say to Pharaoh, if he would remember him or if he would not. All of these are very human actions, but Joseph had no control over any of them. And that's the thing in the human agency I want us to understand this morning the thing that we all have to come to terms with is that you have little to no control over the people in your life and the people around you. You have no control over it. No control over how they talk about you, how they view you, how they see you. You have no control over what they do or what they say. You have no control over what they think about you. None. Zero. It's completely out of our hands. What they say, what they do, their behavior, the sin of the people in the world around us is completely out of our control. And and let me make that personal for you this morning. That person that hurt you, that person that lied about you or that gossiped about you, that person that abused you, that person that mistreated you or abandoned you, person that made your life a wreck and that caused all that pain and all of that hurt, that's not your fault. You have absolutely no control over it. Now, sometimes we're stuck with the consequences of what they do and what they say and what they think. Look at Joseph. He dealt with the consequences time and time again. Slavery was a consequence. Prison was a consequence. But he had no control, and neither do we. But there is one thing that Joseph did have control over, and there's one thing that we do have control over, and that's ourselves. And so what is Joseph's role in this story? What role does Joseph play in his own outcome? I mean, 
He sold into slavery, and from slavery we know that he ended up in Potiphar's house. Now, you've got to understand something about Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house is not like your average Egyptian household. This isn't a, a farmer's household or a merchant's household. Potiphar is way up there. His estate, his home is a, a very well-to-do thing. And so this home that Joseph finds himself serving in is a very, very nice place to be. And when he gets there, he finds favor and he proves himself to be a very effective worker. He proves himself to be diligent and dedicated and he proves himself to be a very effective leader. And because of those things, Joseph ends up running Potiphar's estate, right? He ends up in charge of everything. It says in scripture that Potiphar worried over nothing as long as Joseph was in charge. He was faithful with everything that was placed in his charge, up to and including Potiphar's wife, right? When she tempted him, he said, no, I've, I've got the ability to take control and touch anything in my master's household except for you, and, and I cannot sin against God. Now, that's an interesting side note. Why would he say, I cannot sin against God? Why didn't he say, I cannot sin against Potiphar, my master? For the same reason that when the prodigal son returned home to the father and he said, please accept me back and hire me as a worker. Please take me back because I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. The reason that they say that is because when we sin, we're not sinning against you and I. We sin against God. Right, What Potiphar's wife did to Potiphar, what his brothers did to him, that had a, a consequence on him. But they didn't sin against him, they sinned against God. If I gossip about you, I may hurt you, but I didn't sin against you, I sinned against God. And he says, no. He says, I can't go with you because I can't sin against God. He was tempted time and time again, and time and time again, he stood firm. But because of her role in the story, her human agency in the story of Joseph, he ends up in prison. Now, prison is always a hard place to be, right? I mean, nobody wants to go to prison. It's not what they portray in TV shows like the, the fed, federal prison where everybody's eating these nice meals and living in this nice, Bob and I were talking about it. There's a show we watch in, in, in the prison. It looks like a country club. I'm like, man, if I can get three squares and a cot there, I'm guilty, like it, it doesn't look too shabby. But I've been to prisons that were from Jesus' time frame when we were in Jerusalem. Go back years, decades, generations to the time of Joseph. Man, they're, they're like caves with holes cut out and they throw the food in. It's not a pleasant place to be. But it says Joseph found it a little bit better for him than for other people because once again, Joseph ends up in charge of the whole place. Every prisoner that is in this prison is in his care. And it says, now it's the prison keeper who worries for nothing of anything that is under Joseph's authority. And again, in the prison, Joseph proves himself to be a diligent worker, faithful, obedient, and he proves himself to be a very effective leader. And finally, he ends up with these two personal servants of Pharaoh who have these dreams, and when given the opportunity, he steps into what God's laid out for him, and he interprets these dreams. That's important to remember when the story picks up, where we pick it up today is he's been sold into slavery. Joseph's a boy. He's young. He's naive. He's a little bit arrogant, doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut, just prances around in his fancy coat talking about how much daddy loves him. And it reads, when you read a lot of the stories in the Bible, it, it kind of reads like he was sold into slavery, and then a couple days later, he was in Potiphar's house on a Tuesday, and then by Friday, the wife had tempted him, and so he was in prison, and then he predicted the dreams on Sunday, and it was like two weeks later, he was released, and then a month later, he's wherever he's going to end up. It's not. It's years it, it, it is a very long stretch of time. And in that stretch of time, Joseph goes through a very real humbling process. Right? He's being humbled. Slavery and prison will do that to you. The world will do that to you. It will humble you each and every day. 
life does that. But here's the thing about Joseph. When it came to the human agency, the realization was that we have no control over the people around us. Here's the thing I want you to understand about Joseph's role in his own story. Joseph did not know. Joseph never knew what was coming next. Joseph never knew how the story would play out. Joseph never knew what would happen when it came to the very end. He never knew what would happen next. And through all of this, Joseph has no clue where it's all going to end. And I can't promise you that Joseph spent every day of his confinement in that happy-go-lucky, God's going to save me, I just got to keep going mind frame. I very highly doubt that Joseph sat in his prison cell day after day, week after week, month after month, thinking that surely any day now that cupbearer is going to tell Pharaoh, and they're going to come let me out of this prison. Like, I, I know it's coming. My bags are packed. I'm, I'm ready. And he's sitting in this jail cell singing, Kumbaya, my Lord. How great is my God. He's coming. I guarantee you that there were days, months, where G, uh, Joseph's mind frame probably slipped into weariness and, and brokenness and heaviness. He was probably highly frustrated at times. And just like you and just like me, there were probably times where he was broken and thought, I, I don't know, <laughs> why is it like this? Why me and why here? Why slavery? Why slavery? Why the wife? Why? But if I can't tell you what Joseph's mind frame was the whole time, there's one thing I can tell you. I can tell you what Joseph did do. What Joseph did do was he never gave up. He never left the room. He never stepped out of the battle. Joseph simply kept going. No matter what came, he stayed in the fight. And I want you to listen to this because I read this and then when I wrote it down the other day as I, I was writing this sermon, literally these words as I wrote them, like they, it impacted me. So listen to these words. Joseph never let his circumstances sour his soul. Did you hear that? He never let his circumstances sour his soul. He never let the condition that he was in kill his hope. No matter how bad it got, he never let it sour him, and he never let it kill his hope. Wherever Joseph found himself, whatever position he found himself in, Joseph did his very best. That's important. No matter where he was, no matter what he faced, no matter what they threw his way, Joseph did one thing. Joseph served well. He served well. No matter how, time, how good it was at times and no matter how bad it was at times, no matter how heavy it got, Joseph acted faithfully. He served diligently. And he walked in obedience through those circumstances. And you say, okay, then tell me how he did that because I find it really, really hard to do that. How can a man be sold into slavery by his own brothers, his own family, and then be tempted by a woman that he had nothing to do with doing the right thing, not only by human standards, but by divine godly standards that were laid out for him and still end up in prison day after day? How can he serve well through that? And I'm going to tell you how. Because through it all, he had one fixed focal point that he never took his eyes off of. And that focal point was a divine and sovereign God. See, it wasn't the Potiphar or the jail keeper that Joseph was serving well. He was serving God well. He was looking squarely at God day in and day out and simply taking that next step in the direction of God. And so he did what he was doing well. And it showed through diligent work and faithfulness and everything that was given in to his control. Because he focused on God and that is our role in life. Obedience. Wherever you are in life, whatever circumstances that you're in today, and some of us, some of you are in some very rough circumstances. I know because I talk with you. I pray with some of you. We pray for y'all Monday mornings. I also know that you're in a really hard time sometimes because you're human and I'm human and I'm in a really hard time sometimes. 
But what I want to encourage you with this morning is, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter how heavy it is, no matter how hard it gets, stay faithful. And when you stay faithful, serve well. Be diligent. Keep your eyes on the fixed point. Because I can't promise you a whole lot of things in life with 100% certainty. But this one thing I can tell you, and I can sleep well tonight, because I know without a doubt I am right. It is this. In the course of life, you are going to have moments that are going to come really close to breaking you. You're going to have things that you deal with and people that hurt you and abuse and mistreatment and rumors and financial problems and problems with your spouse and problems with your children and addiction problems. You're going to have those moments that you don't know how to breathe and you don't know how to move forward. There are going to be things in this world and in your life that will threaten to break you, that will threaten to steal your sanity, that will try with everything they have to take your peace and rip it away from you, that will tempt you to walk in the ways of the world and to walk away from a divine, holy, sovereign God. But I want to encourage you today, keep your eyes focused on the one that made you and and the one that loves you. Because when the world tries to break you, and it will try to break you, all you have to do to serve well is to look squarely at him and take the next small step. And if you just keep doing that, then you'll get through to the other side. Because Joseph didn't know the end of his story. God wrote the end of the story. Joseph didn't know where the path ended. God was waiting at the end of the path with open arms. And for you, you don't know where it's taking you and you don't know what's coming next. God already wrote the story. You don't know where it ends up. God's already there. He's already waiting for you. All you have to do is keep your eyes focused on him and I'll do you one better because you have something that Joseph didn't have. We have a divine savior that died for us and rose from us and we have an empty tomb. You keep your eyes on that cross and on that empty tomb and you just take the next step and he's there. And he's waiting on you. So what is God's role in all of this? If Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, and I'm not going to read it because I'm not going to turn back, but it says, you know, in all your ways, don't, or, don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Another way to put it is one of my favorite verses in the Bible is seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about all of that stuff. Don't worry about the human agency. All your role is head down, squarely at God, next step I can possibly take. So what is God's role? 39.3 and 39.21, those are two different verses. One pertains to Potiphar. One pertains to the prison guard. And to sum them up for you, it says Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and gave him success. And then when he got to the prison, the prison guard saw that the Lord was with him and granted him favor. The purpose of that is to understand is that God is at work. There are phrases throughout this story like this. Now it came to pass or and it came to be. That is the providence of God. That is the providence of God. That is God working even when we can't see it from slavery to a place in Potiphar's house to a prison cell to somebody that forgets all about him. Every moment that he worked and every action that he took, God was at work behind the scenes. Everything he's doing, God is doing too, working it out for the good of those that love him. Joseph does not know what the master plan is, but it is providence that God wrote the master plan. Sometimes we don't need to know how it's going to end. It should be enough for us to trust that God already wrote the ending. God already knows how it ends. Our job is to just be obedient, look squarely at him, and take the next best step. It's the providence of God. Think about it. Joseph sold into slavery. That's a terrible thing. But in slavery, he ends up in Potiphar's house. And what happens in Potiphar's house? He learns how to interact with people of very high means and very high influence. He learns on a first-name basis some of these people with very high influence. 
He learns how to master the skill of administration and taking care of a group of people and a group of goods. Then he goes to prison. What happens when he gets to prison? Everything's put under his control once again. And his skills of administration are mastered and they are sharpened. And his leadership abilities are whittled down and put in the furnace. And he comes out with a whole lot of leadership capacity and a whole lot of skill to run everything that's under his control. God had a plan. God was at work. Even when Joseph couldn't see it, he was at work. Even in your life when you can't see it, God is working. So what was the outcome? The cupbearer, right? You're, you're one of you is going to die, one of you is going to live. Oop, you're dying, you're living. See you later. Hey, when you get there, just remember me. I have no doubt that Joseph then sat on the edge of his prison bunk for like a long time and was like, nope, I'm, I'm on my way out today. You know, the guys are in the prison are like, hey, come play go fish or something. And he's like, no, I can't, man. My bag's, I'm, I'm leaving any minute now. And that turned in from a day to a week to a month to a couple years and it just never came to fruition. So what happens when the cupbearer goes back before Pharaoh? How long does Joseph wait? Well, you're going to wait seven days. You got to come back next week to find out how the story ends. <laughs> Do you like that? That's cliffhanger right there. Bob said, put a cliffhanger in. I was like, all right, I got this. But the point that I'm getting at is this. Your application points for today is this. No matter where you find yourself, and you're going to find yourself in tough spots. You're going to find yourself in those moments where your tears running down your face and you're crying out to God and you don't know how to take another step. You're going to find yourself in moments where you lose a loved one or somebody leaves you or and the world just seems against you or you can't pay the bills this month because what's owed is a whole lot more than what seems to be coming in. You're going to find yourself in those moments. And many of you are probably living in one of those moments right now. What I want to encourage you with is this. No matter what circumstance you're in, serve well. Serve to the very highest capacity that you're able to muster in that time. Be diligent and be faithful. If it's not a lot in your bank account that you have to look over, look over it with as much faithfulness as you can. If the people in your world are hurting you and, and it's a pain and, and it's a burden, love them in a faithful way and serve them well in the best way that you can. Just serve well. Because you don't know what's coming next. You, you don't know. You think this is going to go on forever, but you don't know. You don't know when that next fork in the road's coming, and you don't know what lies at the end of either one. You don't know when the pain ends, when the burden ends. You don't know when the next season of joy and, and peace and the ability to go to bed at night and sleep and not lay there with your mind racing. You don't know when it's coming, and you don't know how your story is going to end. But I want you to understand this morning and be encouraged by the fact that God does know how it ends because God pinned it. God knows where your story ends because he's the one that put the last stroke on the paper and set the pen down. He's there and he's waiting for you and he's with you. So all you have to do is just serve well. And how do you serve well when times are kicking you? Every time you get up, it kicks you right back down. You Keep your eyes squarely focused on your focus point. And your focus point is God. Your focus point is a divine God that created you, that knew you before you were born, that knows your name, that knows every hair on your head, that wrote your story, that sent his son for you, that died for you, that rose for you. You keep your eyes squarely on that. And every day you just take the next step in his direction because the favor of God was on Joseph. The favor of God is on you. The Spirit of God is with you. We have a relationship with Christ where it tells us in Scripture that not only is He in us, we are in Him. We abide with Him as one. You keep your eyes focused on that, and you just keep moving forward. 
Because God's at work even if you can't see him. And what you're going through serves a purpose. There's a plan. You may not know it, but just trust that the one who created it is waiting at the end of it for you. Father God, I thank you so much for the love you have for us because we, we don't deserve it, God. I thank you that you understand what's going on in our lives and in this world, even when it looks like such a mess to us, when the burden is so heavy, when we watch the news and things going on in the world just makes us sad, when people hurt us, when money's tight, when relationships are breaking. God, I thank you that through all of that, you're right there, that your word tells us that you're working it out for the good of those that love you. I want to encourage you this morning, every one of us has that thing. We all have that thing, that season of life. Maybe you're not in it right now and you're thinking, man, things are pretty good. That is absolutely awesome. Praise God for that right now and ask him how in that season of joy you can serve him well and have impact. But for those of us that have a season of hardship, of burden, of relationships on the edge, of financial issues on the edge, of whatever it may be, lay that at his feet this morning and just trust that he's working through all of it. Just ask him to give you the strength to keep your focus and keep moving forward, trusting that he's on the other side. Father God, we thank you this morning that your love is never ending. We thank you that you are the divine creator of us, of our lives. Thank you that you use us when we probably should be unusable. I pray, God, that the things that we lay at your feet today, that you'll just take them, that you'll give us a new perspective and encouragement I pray that this week you would allow us to be stronger, to keep our eyes focused on you, to trust that you're working in the background of our stories. We love you. We praise your risen Savior, Son, his name, God Almighty, the name above all names. We praise it all. And we ask everything in your name. Amen. Church, if we stand and sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, he's been my footman in the fire, time after time, born of his
Father God, thank you that your love never fails. Thank you that you love us when we don't deserve it. Strengthen us to move forward into this week. Let us be light to those who need light in the darkness. Let us be the hands and the feet to those that need to be served. Let us serve well and let your name be glorified. We ask these things in your name, in your name alone. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>